two units. <clears throat> and I go thank you to each one of you for being here today and being a part of uh, today's service that we honor our Lord and Savior. Today we're going to be moving into the uh, sixth chapter of Luke on this journey uh, through the gospel. And uh, I have to admit to you, this is uh, probably, a, it's, it is a difficult text. It's a, a difficult passage for us as we try to grasp what Jesus was trying to say to us, uh, it, this, this word goes against culture. It, it's cross grain. It, it's just not what, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not what we expect it to be. And uh, as we hear the word today, it is my prayer that the Holy Spirit will come and that He will open our hearts and our ears and our minds to what He would want to say to us. <clears throat> Luke chapter 6 is, is often termed or titled part of Jesus' Sermon on the Plain. Now, for those of you that have read through the whole sermon, or if you have a red letter edition, all of the red letters in Luke chapter 6, <clears throat> you will recognize that it's very similar to what we read in, in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 that we have come to call the Sermon on the Mount. Now there seems to be quite a bit of debate among scholars. Is uh, Luke chapter 6 and Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, is it the same sermon that Jesus preached or is it a, a similar sermon that took place at a different time? Well, we could spend some time, if we wanted, to, giving the reasons for and against. But the bottom line is, I don't think that it really matters. Each gospel writer, Matthew and Luke, were writing to a specific group of people with a specific purpose for them to understand. <clears throat> and so today, as we look at this Sermon on the Plain and come to this very difficult passage... I would pray that we would begin to hear these words that would take us over the bridge into enemy territory. The bridge that takes us into enemy territory. So turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 6 and all the way over to verse 27. Luke chapter 6 verse 27. Hear now the word of the Lord. But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful 
just as your Father is merciful. This is the word of the Lord. You know, wouldn't it be much simpler if Jesus would have simply said to us, you know, love your neighbor or love your family. That would have been much easier to handle. Much simpler in life. I I mean, wouldn't you expect Jesus to say, love your spouse. Love your children. Love your parents. Even love your neighbor. But what he says is this. Love our enemy. Now, as many of you know, the, in the original Greek language, there are three different words that are translated as one word in the English word. It's the English word that we call love. In the Greek, the one word means passionate feelings for another. So we could begin to identify that that would be the passion and romance that exists between a husband and wife. The second word means a warm, affectionate love to those around us. And that one would be the kind of love that we would have for our parents or our children, even our family dog or or the pizza that we like. The third word The word that's used in this passage, this word that's used to address our enemies, is descriptive of God's love for his creation. It means that no matter what a person does to us, we will never allow ourselves to desire anything but his or her highest goal. We will deliberately and on purpose go out of our way to be good and kind to that person, our enemy. You know, we cannot love our enemy with eros or phileo love. It just will not work. We have been called to love our enemy with agape love. The agape love of Christ, the way that Christ loved his people. A love that is not only from the heart, but also a love from our will. A love that comes with the action of doing that is only possible through the grace of Christ. This teaching is summed up in in a very positive sentence or or statement uh, in verse 31. We have come to call this statement, what? What have we called verse 31? You awake? The golden rule. I think it's important to recognize that the golden rule is part of this teaching about loving our enemies. It it all fits. It's all part of the package. Love our enemies. Do to others what you would want them to do to you. I have a question for you. Have you ever noticed in the midst of of life that oftentimes it seems like so many people in our world focus on the negative instead of the positive? I mean, I am tired of presidential debates and presidential campaigns. It seems to me that the only thing that presidential candidates or anybody involved in politics can do is concentrate on the negative of what their opponent did or didn't do. You know, what I'm really interested in in politics is finding out what someone wants to do. And in the midst of Scripture, I think, and in the midst of the church world, we have found ourselves falling into the same trap of focusing on the negative instead of the positive. Even on this teaching on loving your enemies, I, I found some, some teachings of, of old church fathers, early church fathers is probably a better way to say it, and how they have taught 
the golden rule. They have tended to teach it in a negative form. I, I won't get all these names pronounced maybe like you're familiar with, but in the early first century, a Jewish rabbi by the name of Hillel was asked to teach the whole law while standing on one leg. Okay? Teach the whole law while standing on one leg. So this is what he said. What is hateful to thee, do not to another. What is hateful to thee, do not to another. Phileo, a great Jew of Alexandria, said, What you hate to suffer, do not do to anyone else. As Socrates, the Greek orator, says, What things make you angry when you suffer them at the hands of others, do not you do to other people. The Stoics' basic rule was, what you do not wish to be done to yourself, do not you do to any other. Confucius says, when he was asked, is there one word which one may score as a rule of practice for all one's life, he said, well, is that word not reciprocate? There you go. Did you hear it? Say it again. Reciprocity. Oh, uh, well, never mind. I knew I'd catch you on it. I knew that it would. I, I tried to think, okay, now, uh, Confucius, couldn't you have used an easier word to say? But what he was meaning is this. What you do not want done to yourself, do not to do to others. It's all in the negative. But the golden rule is in the positive. Do to others as you would have them do to you. It's in the positive. William Barclay states, the very essence of Christian conduct is that it consists not in restraining from the bad things, but in actively doing good things. I mean, how many of us have grown up in an era, in a time frame, in Christianity, where it seemed to be that it was all about what we couldn't do, instead of focusing on what we can do? I, I understand that there's some things that as Christians, that God has called us not to be a part of. But the greater message is, can we hear what God is calling us to be a part of? I believe that it starts. This whole loving your enemy has to start with the idea of identifying who our enemy is. I don't know about you, but it was just easier for me if I forget my enemy. I, you know, I would just like, if someone, if, if someone didn't like me, it would just be much easier if they didn't tell me. And I didn't know it. But if I'm going to follow through with the scripture, I need to be in the process of identifying those people around me that I must love. I had a conversation this week with a, a friend of mine who said, Terry, I want to talk with you. And uh, so I said, okay, well, we were sitting together in a group of people, and we said, when this finishes, we'll kind of get over here, and, and uh, we'll talk a little bit. And uh, he said, and, and we continued to talk a little bit and, and visit before this group, was, while the group was still going on. And, and somehow church came up, and what I was going to be preaching on today and I said, he said to me, I said, it's, I'm preaching on loving your enemies. And he said, that's exactly what I need to talk to you about. And then later on, he went on to tell me about a phone call he received from a person. That even though he didn't know it at the time until the phone call came, this person had become his enemy. 
and, and he was asking me, what do you think? What should I do as a Christian? What, what should my response be? And, and well, now that you know that they're your enemy, what are you going to do? Well, I think Jesus gives us some bridges to cross over into enemy territory. And, and he simply begins there in verse 27. But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. Okay, we've identified who they are now. So here's what we got to do. Four things. Four practical applications that you and I can take with us out of this service, out into our world. Now, I wish that I could hear you say to me, and I wish I could say to you, well, this doesn't apply to me because I don't have any enemies. But just like my friend this week, who discovered that someone didn't like what he had done, his choices, I have a feeling that if we were honest, most everyone here today could say, well, I know of someone that works with me or someone that I go to school with doesn't like me. They don't like what I stand for. They don't like the actions that I've done. Whatever it might be, I have a, fe- a feeling that if we were truly honest with ourselves, that most every one of us would say, well, there is someone that I don't get along with. Maybe they're not an outright ugly enemy, but you don't get along. Scripture says that if we are going to be Christians, we must learn to love our enemies. So here were the four things. Number one, do good. Do good. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. What does it mean to do good? Well, I think that it has to do with showing and doing acts of kindness. You know, if you happen to see them at a restaurant, what would happen if you just said to the server, hey, you see those people over there? Would you give me their ticket so that I can pay for it? Do acts of kindness. Find some way to simply do an act of kindness. They may never know that it was you, but if you and I would do acts of kindness to those who do not like us or that we have trouble getting along with, I believe that it would be part of Fulfilling what the scripture says to do good. Secondly, it says, bless them. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Now again, I think that oftentimes in the midst of our culture, in the midst of our society, we place the wrong definition or the wrong emphasis on the word blessing. I shared with you a few weeks ago in going to Belize and 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 being around those Belizean people, and and looking at all that they didn't have compared to all that I do have. And the, the common misconception would be, well, the Lord has blessed me because of all the material possessions that I have. But you know, they didn't have any of the possessions that I had. But I am convinced they had the Lord's blessing. So what is the blessing of God? And how is it that we could bless those who are our enemy? Well, I I think Jesus probably described it first by praying for them. Praying over them. Let us begin to pray for our enemies and ask God to give us the grace and the ideas about ways that we can offer blessing and do good to those that we might call our enemy. Number three, turn the other cheek. And I struggled trying to, okay, how can I explain this? Or how can I put this down on paper? Or how can we talk about this? But I think that in essence... Really, the the emphasis that Jesus is trying to say to us is don't fight back. Don't engage in an argument. Now, I understand that there are times that we must defend ourselves, that we must stand up for ourselves. But I think in terms of our enemy, 
what Jesus is trying to say is, don't engage in an argument. I think that here's, here's something practical, okay? I, I think this is what Jesus was trying to say to us when, when he was saying to turn the other cheek. Probably most of us would consider a missionary from the Latter-day Saints or, or maybe a member of the Jehovah's Witness to be our enemy. And from some sense of the word, I can understand because they have one set of beliefs and, and if they were to sit down with us, their purpose would be to try to engage us and to pull us into their way of thinking. But I was thinking as I read through this and studied this this week and prayed about it, could it be that the Lord, that we Christians, we who believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, maybe what God would want us to do is not engage in an argument to try to defend our faith and try to convince them that our way is a better way. What would it be if we would just engage into a friendly conversation with them, invite them into your home and serve them a cup of coffee, and, and begin to ask them some questions about their life and where they've come from. And, and, and I know there's danger in that because you carry on a conversation with them. You, it could be that they could persuade you. And, and it is my prayer that our faith is strong enough in Jesus Christ that we can learn to turn the other cheek and don't argue about the faith, but just show the love of Christ doing acts of goodness and kindness and blessing them by praying over them. Wow. Is that what Jesus really meant by turning the other cheek? He goes on to say the fourth thing is if they take your cloak, give them your tunic. So as we cross the bridge into enemy territory to fulfill the scripture and learn how to love our enemies, be willing to give them yourselves. I, I think that Jesus was trying to say to us, invest in them. Invest in them. Loan them money, it says, without expecting to be paid back. What would it be? I, I mentioned Jehovah's Witness or Mormons, but what would it be if you and I would discover a Muslim or a Buddhist follower? And we would begin to become involved into their life and begin to do good to them and bless them and pray for them. Not fighting with them over their belief system and our belief systems, but simply investing into their lives from what Christ has invested in us. about someone that practices the lifestyle of homosexuality? What would it be if instead of arguing with them and, and trying to convince them that their lifestyle is sinful, what would it be if we would just love them and do good and show acts of kindness and Bless them and pray for them and don't argue with them. And that we would invest something in our life into their lives so that they would begin to see the love of Christ through us. What would, what would they think? What could begin to happen 
When in the midst of our brokenness, as Brett shared with us, in the midst of our brokenness, they began to see the light of God shining through us. And there would be something that would begin to happen within their lives that would begin to ask, what is it that makes you different? I mean, you know, a lot of those people that I mentioned, the Buddhists and the Muslims and the homosexuals, they don't like Christians very well. And sometimes I think they have reason to do that. Because I'm not sure that the Christian church in general has done a very good job of fulfilling the scripture of Christ to love our enemies, to do good. And to bless them. And to turn the other cheek. And to give them our tunic also. Investing in our life, our lives into their lives. You see, God has called us to take the bridge into enemy territory. And to begin to love others same way that he has loved us. He didn't give up on us while we were yet sinners. In fact, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us so that we might discover his goodness. Solomon said, In Proverbs 25, verse 21. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Here's an idea. Here's a dream. Could we be a church? Full of former enemies. In other words, are we a people who apply the scripture into our lives and to the lives of those who do not like us, our enemies, and we apply the grace of God in such a way that somehow there will become unity in his kingdom? And as his kingdom grows, that we will be A combination, a collection of people that used to be people who didn't like one another. We become a sea of former enemies, now getting to, along and working together to be Christ in our world, to love our enemy is only available through the indescribable love and grace of God. We see Him at work through our crea- throughout all creation. And it causes us to ask, why would He give us enough grace to love our enemy? I want to end my sermon today with a prayer for you. And a prayer for me. And after I prayed, we're then going to sing again the song that we sang earlier that says indescribable. And talks about how wonderful God is. But while we're thinking of God's greatness, I want you also to be thinking about your world that you live. The square in which you live and eat and breathe and have your being. Or maybe you could call it a circle. And that we would begin to ask the Holy Spirit to help us identify our enemy. Maybe they're not out to kill us. But yet we don't get along. And as we focus on the grace and the goodness of God, He 
He would challenge us to love our enemies, to do good to those who hate us, to bless those and pray for those who curse us, to be willing to turn the other cheek, and to somehow give them our tunic also, investing into their life so that somehow through the grace and the power of God they can see His love in us. Bow your heads and let's pray. Father, it would have been so much easier to uh, skip this message, to skip this text. Um, it would have been much easier to focus on what we have tended to call the Beatitudes and just simply say, blessed are those who hunger, for they will be filled. But in the midst of your sermon, you spoke some real practical words to your people and to us today. And Lord, this morning... As we prepare to close and sing this song of how wonderful you are, how incredible is your grace and your creation, I pray that you would draw to our attention our enemies. And Father, that your love would so overwhelm us that it would be our desire today that we would love our enemies. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Before they, as they prepare to sing, I, I wasn't going to do this, but I just sense in my heart today that I need to open the altars specifically this morning for a particular thing for you, for me. Again, if we were in a perfect world, we would have no enemies. But I just sense this morning that maybe as you've listened to these words, the Holy Spirit has spoken to you about a particular person in your life. Someone that doesn't like you very well, that doesn't treat you very well, that you would consider an enemy. And this morning, I want to invite you to come and pray for them. And that as you hear these words of this indescribable God, that you would be challenged to love your enemy in the same way that Christ has loved us. So as we sing, you are invited to pray, to come here to the front, to the altars, and, and just put that person right there and say, Lord, here they are. Help me to do good. Help me to pray for them. Help me to learn what it means to turn the other cheek and to offer an investment into their lives. So let's stand together and Nathan lead us in this song of God's grace and his power. And if the Holy Spirit speaking to you about that person, or maybe it's more than one, From I invite you to come and pray. To the, heights, to the depths of the sea. Creations revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring.
God is able to do amazingly more than you and I could ever think or ask. I'm looking forward to what He is going to do through the faithfulness of us, His people, who will take the Scripture that we believe to be the Word of God, right? This is the authoritative Word of God. And He says to us, love our enemies. And as you and I take his word in our life into his world, he will use us to build his kingdom. And so I greatly anticipate what he has in store for us in the days ahead. Don't forget that tonight, a great opportunity to invite your friends and neighbors to come and see the gospel presented through a movie entitled Courageous. A very clear presentation of the gospel of Christ plus a challenge to us, the believers, to live the kind of life, to be courageous and to live the kind of life that would be pleasing to Him. So I hope that you'll be back here tonight and we'll fill up the sanctuary with our friends and neighbors. May the Lord be with you as you go. Put on a smile and greet one another in the name of the Lord.